Hello everyone, welcome to yours and my favorite part of the week. That's right, is your online health psychology course, and I'm here to walk you through the hottest topics in genetics, epigenetics, and early life development. Now before I begin, um, I'd like to state that I uh, evacuated from a tornado and currently recording this anyway, so there might be a little background, uh, background uh, wind, which you can interpret in one of two ways. One, uh, my dedication to you, my favorite viewer, or two, my seemingly unending uh, economic precarity. Really, it could be a combination of both, but I guess that is the duality of man. So with that said, let's jump into it. Genetics and her uh, heritability. The inheritance of traits in his study of peas, Gregor Mendel, um, an Austrian monk, proposed the idea of dominant traits. Mendel concluded that the recessive green trait appears only when a copy of the recessive gene form is inherited from each parent. Although Mendel publishes a, a discoveries in 1866, Mendel's ideas were not appreciated until the early 20th century. So this is kind of like the uh, genetics, uh, uh, introductory genetics that you kind of get in those uh, biology courses, like your freshman uh, level biology courses, which always a great time. Uh, I ended up having to take that my senior year because my biology credit didn't transfer from my AA degree. And that's not recommended waking up at like 7 a.m., 8 a.m. for a bio class. But regardless, uh, back on topic here, kind of the idea here is that is that we have dominant and kind of recessive genes and a combination of, of a recessive gene or a dominant gene from your parents are going to impact the, impact the expression of that dream, uh, gene, with the most classic example being uh, uh, your eye color. So for example, blue eyes uh, are recessive genes, while brown eyes are uh, dominant genes. And this is being overly simplistic, but the idea here is that if you get a, uh, a brown genes um, from your parent, that is your eye color, uh, from your father, I should say, so brown uh, eye color from your father and a blue eye gene from your uh, mother, the uh, brown gene will basically trump the uh, blue gene because it's the brown is the dominant gene, and therefore what your eye color will be will be brown. It's kind of just the broad overview. We really don't know the need to know the specifics. But that's kind of the classic bio uh, plant based kind of P thing, uh, uh, biology uh, and genetics. Next, uh, uh, eugenics. Mendel's ideas were exploited and taken into a scientific cul de sac by the eugenics movement, which proposed that human species could be improved by breeding from, quote, superior white stock, while reproduction of the genetically unfit was to be stopped. Uh, eugenics, uh, eugenicists, I should say, uh, misuse ideas of dominant and recessive genes to explain in simplistic terms complex human behaviors and mental illnesses and fail to take account of environmental effects on human development. So this is uh, we, um, uh, a, a classic example of why understanding the application of psychology um, and how that it, uh, specifically unfolds in kind of public policy or kind of general frameworks of thinking. In the case of, you know, not just psychology, but kind of science as a whole. So we kind of have, again, going back to this idea of dominant and recessive genes uh, with kind of eye color. Well, what you can do from kind of like a social perspective is saying, okay, well, maybe there are like dominant, I'm just making up something here, the dominant smart gene or the, or, uh, or the dominant like dumb gene or something along those lines. And of course, uh, how are those going to play out? Well, science uh, application does not uh, take place in a vacuum, but it takes place within our kind of uh, consisting social norms and kind of our uh, the power relations of that time. So kind of early uh, 20th century, late uh, 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 19th century, uh, how that will be applied uh, will be <laughs> along uh, racial boundaries. And, uh, uh, and it's going to play out of, uh, alongside the racial boundaries that exist within a society. So obviously, Obviously, that is going to mean that racial minorities kind of, quote, are going to have some collection of, of inferior slash, I don't know, some kind of taking that dominant recessive gene framework uh, and uh, use that framework to kind of try and breed out those, quote unquote, like inferior genes, something like that. And as you can see, kind of on the right hand side, this often uh, typically played out, especially uh, har harmfully to uh, uh, racial groups at risk and also poor people, uh, homeless people in general and incarcerated people uh, as well. So we can see that from this study here, uh, uh, found uh, the authors found that in California, uh, a disproportionate amount of people who were exposed to sterilization were uh, Latino uh, women and men. Uh, so kind of, again, the idea here is those people, uh, they're in jail, so therefore they're demonstrating uh, their kind of uh, genetic uh, inferiority, and therefore the uh, government, or in this case, uh, prison guards or whatever, uh, can take a kind of a proactive step to kind of weed out those uh, inferior genes within the gene pool. 
So a kind of a classic example of the importance of thinking about how we think about psychology, how we think about these constructs and um, how those are then later in return kind of applied to the real world and how also uh, all this research ultimately will be uh, filtered through society, through public policy, government structures, um, uh, ways of thinking. But also that interpretation of these kind of scientific uh, constructs uh, will also be influenced by exist, uh, uh, existing uh, structures and belief systems in kind of power relations. So for a very classic example and kind of getting at the heart of what we, uh, of, of the importance of interpretation, application, um, and critically examine how we apply uh, what we think we understand about psychology or science as a whole. In 1905, the study of meiosis revealed that gender is based on chromosomes, thread-like structures inside the nucleus of animal and plant cells. Each chromosome is made of protein and a single molecule of DNA. Chromosomes keep uh, DNA tightly wrapped around spool-like proteins called histones. Uh, without this tight packaging, DNA would be too uh, long to fit inside gels. So kind of the idea here is uh, we, uh, uh, in the early 20th century of kind of taking, taking those uh, plant kind of understanding, a little more than that, but uh, for our purposes, kind of that plant understanding of, of genes and then applying it to other aspects such as uh, gender. Now, obviously we do not know kind of, and we'll get to this later on, kind of a genetic basis of gender, or if there's even really such thing as, as this kind of idea here, but kind of what we're actually working with and we'll talk through is kind of um, the uh, sex chromosomes and how ultimately your biological sex uh, will be uh, um, theoretically uh, determined through kind of these specific chromosomes. But kind of the big point here is that, you know, we kind of uh, largely began this process or solidified it, I guess I should say, uh, in the early 20th century. In humans, each uh, uh, cell normally contains approximately, or I should say, 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46 chromosomes. Uh, 22 of these pairs, called autosomes, are look the same in both biological males and females. The 23rd pair, the sex chromosomes, differ between males and females. One sex chromosome, X, is bigger than the other, Y. A mismatch, a mismatch pair of one X and one Y chromosome occurs in male cells, while a match pair of X chromosomes occur in female cells. Females produce eggs with only X chromosomes, while males produce sperm with an X or a Y chromosome. So again, we have 23 uh, sets of chromosomes, with 22 being uh, identical for both biological males and females. However, the 23rd pair is where we kind of see sex differences, and that is if a uh, a person has one X and one Y chromosome on that 23rd pair, that is a sex chromosome. So an X and a Y, that means biologically they are male. While the, uh, or I should say, while females, uh, biological females uh, will have uh, two uh, uh, X chromosomes on that 23rd uh, sex chromosomes. Now there are differences such as intersex people, which we're uh, not gonna cover a lot in, uh, in this uh, chapter, but we will uh, kind of touch on that in other chapters, and also um, I will make sure to include uh, kind of a lecture on kind of that broad overview from a different class uh, within our, in our uh, Canvas course. But for now, just understand that the 23rd pair, these kind of differences between biological males and females, and ultimately who is, uh, uh, which um, parent is uh, ultimately, you know, on a biological level, deciding the sex of, the, uh, um, of their uh, child. And that person is, or that parent is the male because a sperm could produce either an X or a Y chromosome, while a female uh, only produces eggs, which is an X chromosome. So the X chromosome is a given from the female, the mother, um, and the, uh, which has to be determined uh, in this kind of binary, of course, um, understanding of, of, of uh, biological sex is the X or Y chromosome, which, which is um, uh, selected by the sperm itself. So again, kind of takeaway here, the sperm, AKA the father on a biological level, uh, um, uh, determining the biological sex of their um, child. Next, the human genome. A genome is any uh, in, uh, organism's complete set of DNA, including all of its genes. An organism's genome contains all of the information needed to build and maintain the organism. Knowing the complete sequence of the human genome is similar to having a manual on how to construct the human body. This manual has more than 3 billion pages, and thus, not really uh, easy to read. It was accompanied by much fanfare and hype as a, quote, landmark in science. The first draft of the human genome appeared on uh, February 2nd, 2001. 
So basically the overarching goal of this thing called the Human Genome Project, which we'll talk, which we'll talk about uh, momentarily, uh, was to kind of uh, uh, kind of map out uh, humanity. So all of our cells, all of our kind of a DNA, and thus have this blueprint of humanity. And then theoretically, the idea is to identify uh, at the time kind of specific genes that predict uh, maybe certain personality traits, certain behaviors, uh, uh, health outcomes. Is there the cancer gene, something along that? Is there, is there the alcoholism gene? Um, and then maybe target those genes or kind of like maybe some kind of this like personalized medicine was kind of like a big kind of a thing around this time. So ultimately kind of like revolutionizing science. Like we're going to get this genetic information then we're going to get to kind of the root issues, which is kind of like genes. It's, it's kind of like uh, the framework that, the, that this uh, project was kind of uh, working under. More or less, obviously, there's going to be some gradations uh, on that, but that's kind of the uh, assumption kind of built into this. And one uh, big immediate challenge is that we have, it's kind of as stated, like reading a three billion page manual, basically trying to understand, as we talked about with kind of uh, um, um, neural connections and uh, our um, microbiome, uh, kind of trying to understand and piece these different, uh, these billions of pages um, uh, and trying to interpret them, understand how they interact with each other, because it's not going to be straightforward. It's not going to be like a correlation situation, but very, very complex and dynamic uh, is uh, <laughs> at the very least incredibly challenging. So to fill in those gaps and build on what I just said a little bit, uh, the NIH, uh, which is the National Institute of Health, National Human Genome Research Institute, is steering many research programs on the human genome. One objective is to identify any gene suspected of causing an inherited disease. More than 2,000 genetic text, text, tests enable patients and families to be informed about their genetic risk for disease and to help professionals diagnose disease. These scientific advances do not come without uh, consequences for human liberty, privacy, and rights. For example, privacy and fairness in the use of genetic information, including the potential for genetic discrimination in education, employment, immigration, and insurance. There's a potential for a new indelible type of stigmatization. So kind of idea, again, kind of the idea here was like to map all the genes and then compare people's genes uh, and say like, oh, this person had developed uh, multiple sclerosis. Let's compare their genes and then identify the gene that is the multiple sclerosis kind of gene. And thus you have all these kind of genetic tests and stuff like that. Um, and ultimately what has happened is it's uh, the kind of, despite much of the fanfare, it has produced very, 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 very limited results. And what we has been found is not kind of universal consensus uh, of, of how we interpret them. Um, so this has led to kind of then uh, kind of a revisionist uh, kind of uh, argument that's like, uh, yeah, this all of this was, uh, not I'm gonna say it was worthless, but was much overhyped and as actually not kind of the secret to unlocking uh, human health outcomes. And there's basically this massive debate. Uh, you really don't need to know the specifics of this. Uh, people debating like, okay, why don't we have more of a preventative health uh, um, uh, approach wherein we target specific environmental stressors, environmental contexts like poverty or uh, you know, living in abusive uh, relationships, uh, minority rights, women's rights, whatever, um, f uh, like food programs, like uh, uh, free student lunch or something like that, like um, for lower income uh, uh, children. And because we know that all those things are predictive of all kinds of hosts of, of negative uh, health outcomes and kind of ne and negative health uh, behaviors. So why don't we just target that instead? Um, and it's kind of what is the kind of point of this personalized healthcare uh, or like theoret that's largely theoretical and um, would ultimately kind of be uh, quite expensive, especially in a U.S. context where like healthcare uh, struggles to uh, provide uh, even those who are insured kind of uh, to uh, fully insure uh, s uh, somebody with an illness. Like, for example, like my grandparents right now, my grandma just recently had like a stroke and she's like in a physical rehab place and she can only stay there for like uh, like 20 days or something like that, despite having uh, Medicare. Um, so even when you have insurance, uh, you know, you can't really get the optimum at, <laughs> in general, the optimum uh, uh, like health treatment. So kind of a, so it's kind of like a three prong approach here of critique of like one, why don't we target things that we know are known predictors of negative health outcomes or negative developmental outcomes as a whole uh, to um, the research that we have on these uh, 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 genetic links to certain uh, chronic illnesses or conditions are very, very limited in general uh, to have 
really have not uh, kind of bared out. Like, for example, there's no such thing as like an alcoholism gene. There, there's no evidence of that. Um, and then ultimately, how will this, even if there was a case where we could find these, how would that actually play out in a healthcare system, uh, let alone in a United, in United States healthcare system? And there's like a big, big kind of debate. If you're interested in this, I can link you kind of like a book of some ethicists of like debating this. Okay, and then also we have this other aspect here of that, okay, say that we can uh, identify this theoretically or <laughs> maybe not. So uh, currently constructed, uh, probably not. Um, so, but let's say that we take that information and like eugenists in the past kind of take it and just run with it, overinterpret it and apply it through kind of, in a, in a, uh, use that interpretation through or filter it through kind of existing power structures. Well, in this case here, maybe this can open up the, uh, there's potential risk for kind of uh, genetic discrimination. So this person here has the bad genes or something like that. So I'm not going to employ that guy because maybe uh, they'll be more sick from work. Uh, maybe uh, the, which will increase my company's insurance premiums, something along those lines. Or maybe uh, that person has the misbehaved gene. Again, just making it up. There's no such thing. Therefore, that person's not going to be as hard as a worker. So regardless of if it's real or not, there's kind of a potential uh, avenues by which that employers or governments uh, can uh, interpret uh, kind of the human genome in ways that are uh, destructive uh, towards uh, just regular people. And that's something to keep in mind, uh, you know, as, as kind of we continue on. Uh, it's always important to kind of keep keep these big ethical things in mind, just, in mind not just kind of throw something out there uh, because it can be uh, quite uh, catastrophic. It's a matter of life and death as kind of we review with the eugenics uh, history. Heritability of human traits. In discussing heritability, we need to distinguish between a person's genotype and phenotype. The genotype is the part of the genetic makeup of an individual which impacts their potential characteristics. They include eye color, weight, uh, height, and kind of more theoretical uh, general intelligence and personality traits. Phenotype is a type uh, is a set of observable characteristics of an individual resulting from the interaction of their genotype with their environment. So for the purposes of our class, you can think of gen uh, uh, genotype as something like height or... Um, like shoe size. So something that theoretically the environment is having le at least kind of less of an impact, even then it, there, it's going to uh, at times, not so much with high color in general, but uh, even like shoe size, but it doesn't matter. So for this purpose here, kind of like things that are um, uh, uh, less kind of prone to environmental influence, um, Versus a uh, phenotype, so kind of a something you see that's as a result of a kind of interaction with your genotype, with your environment. So kind of the classic example, this is flamingos. Like they're actually like kind of like naturally white, but their diet uh, increases like this pink shade of their body. So literally their lifestyle choices, e aka what it is that they're eating, influences the shade of their color of the flamingo. Or even for humans, like obviously we have uh, melanin that, uh, that uh, impacts the shade of our skin color. But however, you can spend more time outdoors or more time or less time outdoors, which is going to impact uh, kind of your uh, shade of the color of your skin. So in that case, we have our environments and, and, and uh, specifically our choices, aka to like go sunbathe or go to a, um, a tanning salon or something like that. And that uh, sh uh, changing our, uh, our skin tone appearance. So kind of just keep those kind of broad examples in mind. Uh, some of these, like I have here, if you guys have listened in the textbook, uh, intelligence, personality traits, it's very much debated if this is like genotype, phenotype. Uh, for example, general intelligence, IQ test score is highly correlated with uh, class and uh, access kind of the resources, which obviously are going to be environmental factors. Um, so, you know, a little, a little more dicey there, and this is gonna be more of a theoretical argument, uh, depending on your perspective on personality and general intelligence, or just intelligence as a whole. Uh, but, so we'll keep it kind of uh, broad to like genotype being kind of like eye color versus phenotype, uh, things that the environment would influence, AKA your life choices, where you live, uh, parenting, stuff like that. Heritability and twin studies. It's important to uh, uh, mention that this, the, these uh, results from these studies are open to interpretation. An H squared, that is heritability, estimate is the proportion of a trait variation among individuals that is a consequence of genetic factors. It is not the degree of genetic influence on that trait for any particular person. For example, if the heritability of, personali of a personality trait is 0.6, we cannot say that 60% of an individual's personality is inherited from his or her parents and 40% from the environment. In most uh, circumstances, the proportion of genetic and environmental influences for any individual and traits are not known. Also, high heritability does not equal high unchangeability. 
So kind of the idea here is to, for heritability studies, is to estimate how much of a behavior is from, quote unquote, the environment and how much is from, quote unquote, genes. Uh, the uh, the kind of the, the stringentness of kind of that dichotomy is open to debate, but that's kind of the general idea here. And you get this like proportion. So you'll get something like, uh, I'll just make up something, extroversion is 0.6 uh, heritable, okay? And most people kind of, inter or a lot of people, I should say, interpret that as, therefore, your individual extroversion is uh, uh, 60% from your quote unquote genes. However, one, theoretically, uh, kind of the argument of that or that interpretation, one interpretation or how uh, kind of the standard interpretation of it without getting into kind of the big debate of this is that uh, that 60 percent number would be means that across the population, 60 percent of extroversion is related is, is heritable. It is from uh, some combination of genes. But that does not mean within a specific person that 60% of, again, their extroversion is related to uh, genes. So basically, the distinction is between the kind of global population theoretical uh, uh, rate or, or proportion of of a uh, gene being heritable and uh, and the uh, versus an individual's uh, rate of heritability. And those two things can differ because the population one is the a theoretical average, while you know the people will fall above or below that average. Also, it's important to uh, keep in mind that uh, heritability does not equal unchangeability. So, for example, even things like height, I we know uh, in my own research has found and other research has found that being exposed to uh, stressors uh, prenatally or kind of lack of nutrition, uh, 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 maternal uh, uh, undernutrition or malnutrition while pregnant or being exposed to stressors or malnutrition uh, during early uh, childhood is uh, related to something called stunting, which we will talk about, which will literally decrease your height. So it's important to keep in mind that high heritability does not mean you can change uh, the kind of uh, that uh, behavioral outcome. The ultimate point of twin studies are to attempt to determine whether identical twins reared together are more similar to each other than fraternal twins reared together. So basically the idea here is that you have twins who are reared, reared together. These are uh, twins, uh, identical twins are going to have identical DNA, all right? So kind of the idea here is that you can measure, uh, recruit uh, uh, two groups of, of participants, one group identical twins, which will have identical DNA uh, versus fraternal twins who do not have identical DNA. And then you're gonna and then administer them, for example, uh, like personality tests, intelligence tests, whatever. And you take their results and you compare them uh, to each other. That is the identical twins to the uh, fraternal. And then say, for example, our, um, our identical twins had very, very high correlated uh, introversion scores, while our fraternal twins did not. This theoretically tells us that the uh, introversion is highly heritable. It's highly determined by quote unquote genes because the identical twins who share again 100% of their DNA have very, very similar introversion scores, while fraternal twins, again, theoretically, this is a made up example, do not. So it's kind of comparing identical twins to fraternal twins, comparing their behavioral, uh, their health differences, and then drawing conclusions about uh, heritability from those results. Now, there's a whole host of critiques into this, which we can spend all day on, but some of them uh, include uh, identical twins could be uh, more psychologically similar because they share prenatal environments. Some scholars argue the prenatal environment is the most important predictor of future developmental outcomes. So kind of the idea here is that uh, the identical twins, although theoretically, or, or, or I should say are 100% uh, um, uh, g genetically the same. However, they also still shared a specific uh, prenatal shared environment. So therefore, although they are genetically the same from, from you know, uh, conception, they also shared the same prenatal environment from conception. Thus, trying to disentangle that shared in, uh, um, uterine environment from their quote unquote, uh, or their 100% similar uh, genes is uh, quite difficult. Uh, so kind of trying to unpack prenatal environments from uh, identical D DNA, it's uh, theoretically not possible. Some of the scholars, some other scholars would argue that. Um, because from literally conception, they have these uh, children have always had shared environments. Thus, you can never really separate. Like foundationally, they have shared environments. So therefore, maybe their shared environment may be uh, driving some of that high correlation between our hypothetical introversion example.
Also, it does not account for any environmental impact, intergenerational life history or genetic expression or the genome. So basically, the longer uh, argument here is that maybe there's some kind of intergenerational uh, uh, um, effects that are going to be expressed within these identical twins, again, which may be driving their similarities. Um, often uh, as well, identical twins are often treated similarly versus maybe fraternal twins who are a uh, boy and a girl and thus uh, maybe treated uh, slightly differently. So again, kind of the idea here is that they, uh, the treatment differences from very early on or from like day one of birth may be contributing to some of these similarities of outcomes in identical twins. Heritability technically says little or nothing about how malleable, alterable a trait is. And heritability is not a fixed number. If range of environmental influences on a trait within a population are reduced, the heritability of that trait will increase because more of the differences in that trait will be due to genetic factors. And all this argument basically is saying that the, all heritability is is the proportion between theoretically genes and the environment. And thus, if you have uh, you live in a context where everybody has very similar environmental circumstances, that would uh, that would kind of increase the proportion of heritability from uh, genes because the environment is held cost, uh, constant. So you basically have two silos and and uh, and. Um, or I should say a single silo, and you can imagine two liquids, one being uh, 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 your genes, uh, probably say the genotype, and two, um, your uh, environment. And you can imagine pulling out some of that water, that's uh, the environment water, and then, and then thus kind of that silo, the proportion of that silo being genotype is now higher because you've re literally removed uh, parts of the environment from that proportion of that theoretical silo. So ultimately kind of the point is, is the extent to which uh, we the the proportion is uh, of a uh, heritable trait is uh, um, is uh, attributed to uh, genes can differ for and also you can imagine for example two kind of plants and say I water the plants like identical uh, every single day all right and then the, then we can compare differences in how well the plants uh, emerges is it strong is it producing fruit whatever but then uh, say I run that same experiment. And then this time I give one plant way more nutrients, way more sunlight, proper water supply, whatever, better soil versus the other plant, I don't. And then I compare the outcomes. Okay, well now I've introduced all these different kind of different environmental uh, factors, which would then impact the heritability score. And the former, wherein I'm treating those um, uh, plants identical, they would have theoretically a higher uh, genetic score because our environmental uh, input is uh, limited or basically the same. Versus the other uh, set wherein one is getting like, one plant is getting like all this extra nutrition, uh, soil, uh, water, whatever. And the other is kind of just getting standard care or maybe neglected. Now we have much more environmental variability. We have a lot more flexibility within the environment. And therefore, that's going to impact that, that proportion of heritability, like mathematically speaking. So the introduction of more variants, more variables in environment can impact this proportion. Again, kind of noting that uh, basically the argument being, therefore, these heritability scores are not like this static uh, thing and are, are and open to multiple interpretations. Paul Derman et al. 2015 reported a meta-analysis of twin correlations with variance estimates of 17,804 traits from 2,748 publications based on 14 million, about 500,000 partly dependent twin pairs, virtually all published twin studies of complex traits. What he found, or what they found, uh, was across all traits the reported, uh, reported, heritability was 49%, indicating an almost exactly equal contribution of genes in the environment. The relative proportion of influence differ from 50-50 for specific functions and characteristics. The largest heritability estimates were for uh, traits in such things such as eyes, followed by ears, nose, and throat, uh, skin, and uh, kind of skeletal system. So again, kind of just like physical traits, uh, your eye color, again, your nose, kind of facial structure, stuff like that, were found to be the most heritable. While the lowest were found for traits in the environment, uh, reproductive and social value domains. One example of a psychological variable is emotional overeating, EOE, the tendency to eat more in response to negative emotions. Harrell et al. 2017 examined the relative genetic and environmental influence on EOE in toddlerhood and early childhood in 2,400 British twins born in 2007. Genetic influences on EOE were found to be minimal, while shared environmental influence explained most of the variants. EOE is, quote, moderately stable from 16 months to five years and continuing environmental factors shared by twin pairs at both ages explain longitudinal association. 
Nature, be, nature may be more important for structural and anatomical differences, while nurture has greater influence on psychological and social differences. So in this case here, we're going back to that meta-analysis. We found that, again, kind of physical traits, eye color, most likely are, had kind of higher rates of theoretical heritability. So it's a kind of classic, like, oh, you look just like your grandma or something like that. Um, so it's kind of uh, theoretically more kind of genotype based. While the lowest heritability instrument, uh, estimates were traits uh, such as social value domains and, uh, and um, uh, reproductive and kind of just uh, in environmental traits like as a whole. So kind of it's, as stated here, or I should say maybe something like, I don't know, how how much time you're studying in college? <laughs> how much are you paying attention right now? <laughs> something like that. So kind of really kind of these like socially based kind of like in the real, you know, quote unquote real world, but it's kind of in your social world, uh, things, social values. I don't know, maybe something like voting behavior. There's not like the X, whatever, some gene that predicts exactly how you're going to vote, something like that. Um, those uh, had the, the theoretical lowest uh, heritability estimates or I shouldn't say theoretically, but within that meta-analysis. And then we had another example here, this emotional overeating. And what this study uh, found uh, was that uh, the uh, strongest predictors of uh, emotional overeating in sets of British twins in 2007 were shared environmental uh, factors. So things like their neighborhood, your schooling, your parents, your class, race, uh, um, etc. So it's just ultimately shared environmental uh, factors were the... Uh, um, uh, most significant predictors of emotional overeating. And then we kind of have this theoretical argument from our author, authors who argued that nature could be more uh, important for structural and anatomical difference versus nurture maybe uh, being more important for psychological and social differences. Uh, this is also kind of debated. Uh, for example, our, our brain structures are... Um, um, are are going to be impacted by our prenatal environment. So again, prenatal you know environment is going to impact that, um, um, or even something like malnutrition. Again, uh, prenatally and uh, postnatally uh, can also impact structure. But you know this is kind of the, the author's uh, argument. But for our purposes, we can kind of keep it broad as kind of physical characteristics, kind of having higher rates of heritability, uh, while kind of social uh, um, outcomes, uh, having lower rates of heritability is fine. Um, and then just make sure you know these kind of two uh, studies that are reviewed. Next, we have genome-wide association studies, GWAS. Most modern uh, molecular genetic studies use genome-wide association studies, GWAS. This examines the associations between thousands of genes and a personality trait of interest. So kind of the idea of GWAS, and I worked in kind of a GWAS-oriented lab, we did many things, but the GWAS is ultimately like uh, you collect someone's DNA and just throw and then uh, upload it to some program and you have like all their kind of DNA uh, on whatever in this like big uh, database, all right? So I collect someone's DNA and then I uh, also administer to them a personality trait, something like that. So just think big five or whatever, something like that. So how um, open this to experience are you? How extroverted you are? Something like that. Um, so then uh, what uh, the researchers do is try and uh, identify correlations between the uh, your personality test scores, your big five scores, your introversion levels, and any individual gene. So they're just basically doing mass correlation analysis of just a ton, a ton of things called SNPs, SNPs. And kind of the idea then is you identify that correlation, you say, all right, so I've now identified the introversion gene. I've now identified the alcoholism genes. And uh, what, what research has found is a number of limitations to this approach. Uh, lack of consistency in finding across studies um, in the amount of variance explained in traits or diseases is very low. So for example, uh, known SNPs explain less than 2% of the variation in body mass index, despite the evidence of greater than 50% heritability from twin and family studies, a phenomenon uh, termed missing heritability. The missing heritability problem states that genetic variants in the genome-wide association studies cannot completely explain the heritability of complex traits. Few replication between genes and personality traits. So kind of the idea, so the big kind of big issue here, known as the missing heritability problem, is that from those heritability studies, aka those twin studies, comparing uh, identical twins to fraternal twins. And again, so we give uh, both twins a uh, big five personality test. 
the identical twins score, uh, their scores are very correlated in extroversion, while the fraternal twins are less correlated in extroversion. Thus, theoretically, we have found, oh, because identical twins share uh, 100% of the same DNA, that means genes are, are uh, driving this uh, extroversion difference. Because again, the identical twins have higher correlations of, of their uh, extroversion uh, uh, test scores versus the fraternal twins having lower uh, correlations of their extroversion test scores. So then the next question is, okay, well, what specific genes are um, theoretically causing this difference in extroversion? And what has, and the problem is, known as uh, the missing credibility problem, is that GWAS studies basically never are able to find those genes. We cannot find them. So thus, for this example here, the SNPs explain less than 2% of variance in body mass index. So kind of specific uh, SNPs, broadly stated, are single indicators of genes. We don't need to get that specific here. Um, and uh, thus, we should be able, by using that correlation, providing the big five tests, something that measures extroversion, uh, and then uh, looking for associations between that test and specific SNPs, specific kind of DNA strands, we should be able to find them. Again, we like can't. <laughs> the SNPs we have found, for example, in body mass index only explain 2% of the variation body mass index. So basically that you want to shoot for 100% <laughs> of, of the of uh, of explaining our body mass index, or at least 50%, because that's what other heritability, those twins in family studies, identical twin studies, uh, suggest. And again, the problem is we don't find it. So then the question is, is like, okay, are the heritability uh, studies, these identical twin studies, are there some severe limitations that we're, misinter we're misinterpreting um, heritability studies? Possible. Um, is it also possible that, that there is basically no single gene uh, that is going to predict these highly complex social outcomes or health outcomes? Also very much possible. Um, is it more some kind of combination of uh, genetic networks, which is actually where a lot of research is uh, moving towards instead of individual genes, but kind of like networks, kind of like our brain, uh, networks of genes maybe uh, working together. But ultimately, this is uh, kind of a problem. And this bringing it back around to the home human genome problem, uh, um, uh, human genome uh, program uh, or project. Uh, then the question is, is like, okay, well, can we find, is it even possible uh, to find kind of like the cancer gene, which we really haven't been able to find, find despite like billions of dollars looking for this thing. Uh, or is it even possible? Or is it not gene-based? And instead, going back to that earlier argument, we should be kind of taking more of a preventive health uh, approach to identify like toxins in the environment, like that are predictive, at least in animal models, of the uh, cancerous uh, cells uh, emerging, such as like, I don't know, uh, those uh, plastics or pollution or discrimination from like healthcare or, uh, checks or something like that. Um, those kind of things that instead we should even targeting because this is kind of more or less, depending on the specific outcome, it kind of a fool's errand is the argument. So that's kind of like the big, one of the big debates right now. Epigenetics. This is epigenetics is a study of heritable changes caused by mechanisms other than changes in the underlying DNA sequence. The epigenetic inheritance system has been described as quote, a soft inheritance in comparison to genetics, which is quote, a hard inheritance. Continuing on, the inheritance of traits in genetics occurs as a result of rare genetic mutations, which involve DNA mutation, but selection is slow in making adaptations to the environment, uh, in, to the constantly changing environment. While soft inheritance system of genetics, on the other hand, is able to adapt to fluctuations in the environments, such as changes in nutrition, stress, and toxins. So basically our, our theoretical framework here is that there are uh, changes that occurs to DNA, uh, uh, DNA, such as like mutation, but this often takes like centuries, if not longer, or some, you know, a long period of time. Uh, however, we need to, humans, one of the features of them, as we've already talked about, is adaptations. Okay, so change is so kind of matching our uh, biology to the environment that we live in to theoretically prepare ourselves on a biological level to kind of deal with that environment. Now, our environments uh, can be quite negative at times and thus um, kind of our, our um, adaptations uh, can be negative as well, because adaptation, again, does not necessarily mean good. It just is, it's, <laughs> at least on a biological level. So um so ultimately, the idea is for epigenetics is our environment impacting our genetic expression, uh, allowing for kind of more uh, flexible, adaptive, quick adaptations. Uh, so we are uh, more optimally, uh, more optimally prepared to uh, uh, kind of behaviorally and biologically um, perform or behave uh, within our environment. 
Epigenetics at cellular level produces cell differentiation by determining the functional types of cells, such as the hepatocytes in the liver, neurons in the brain, or skin cells, as well as influencing whether or not they become cancerous. Within the central nervous system, epigenetics are involved in various neurodegenerative disorders and physiological responses such as Alzheimer's disease, depression, schizophrenia, multiple sclerosis, and stress. Epigenetic changes include DNA methylation and histone modification, both of which regulate gene expression without altering the linear sequence of the DNA. So what we're getting at here is that epigenetics are not changing the underlying structure of the DNA, but changing the expression of the DNA. So kind of modifications through something called methylation, which you don't need to know for this, the kind of the specifics on how that uh, that goes about. But ultimately what we're doing here is that on the biological level, um, adaptations to our environment through kind of uh, these uh, DNA um, Methylation, which in return uh, uh, is kind of associated with specific behavioral and health outcomes. And what uh, DNA methylation does is adds a methyl group to the DNA molecule, which can change the activity of a DNA segment without changing the sequence. DNA methylation typically acts to repress or switch off gene transcription. Essentially, DNA methylation is a switch which switches genes in the genotype on or off to produce the phenotype the human being we actually become rather than the one determined by a random mix of parental genes. This re the questions remain, such as over-interpretation of results from a ground of prenatal epigenetics than intergenerational. So what you can think about uh, for epigenetics is like a light switch, all right? So certain environmental factors activating particular genes in our environment, thus our phenotype, what it is that we see, our behaviors, all right? So we have this underlying genotype, but our environment literally activating or deactivating sets uh, uh, specific genes, which in return will impact health behaviors or health related outcome. So just making up something, say I am fetus me and then I am born, all right? And say I am born at risk of developing depression. Now at risk, uh, does not mean that I'm for sure going to develop uh, uh, depression in my life. However, if I am born into a very uh, adverse circumstances, uh, like a low income, maybe there's a lot of discrimination against me, uh, we, uh, we uh, have little resources in the home, my, my parents have a few friends, I can't go outside and play, whatever. So this combination is cumulative stressors um, act as a way in which that is one potential mechanism of epigenetics. So basically those stressors uh, through a uh, biological and uh, genetic process can again turn on or off that gene. So say I have some set of at, uh, genes that make me at risk of depression. Well, I'm exposed to those uh, adversities in my environment and those uh, adverse exp uh, uh, experiences start a, um, uh, um, a mediate a, uh, um, a biological process, which in return, turn on my depressive genes. Thus, now I am significantly more likely to become depressed. However, you can imagine a scenario where I'm born at risk of depression, but I, I, I grew up in a, a wonderful home, say we, whatever, we hit the lottery or something, I don't know, we don't blow our money. We hit the lottery, we live, we have a lot of friends and la la la, it's all beautiful. Well, now I never uh, encounter, at least early on in my life, those very severe uh, stressors that accumulate and thus my uh, at-risk depressive genes do not activate. They never turn on. Our environment never switches on that light switch of depression and therefore I'm significantly less uh, at risk of developing depression as an adult or a child. Now, uh, epigenetics uh, has a lot of like pop psychology interpretations as you may have seen. And uh, what we have a firmer understanding of, of epigenetics is stressors with prenatally, but kind of ep epigenetics of like multiple generations, like, oh, my grandparent uh, seven generations ago had this bad thing happen to me. Therefore, that's why I'm an asshole online. <laughs> okay, that is a, can be, uh, is, uh, many people argue, or scholars argue, is a massive over uh, interpretations of results, uh, because it's very difficult to disentangle, uh, for example, like your parents retelling you those stories of stressors that they experience, which in return may influence your outcomes, because you're being told about those things or whatever, or your parents are themselves very stressed out, uh, and thus maybe parent you a little bit different, that make you at greater risk of certain negative developmental outcomes. So it's kind of trying to tease apart like, oh, this thing happened to my family 10 generations ago. Therefore, 
the genetics, specifically the genetics is why, um, or my epigenetics is specifically why uh, I am behaving this way, is very is 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 um, not really uh, um, has a firm ground to stand on. It's it's much more debated versus prenatal stress that uh, the epigenetics during uh, prenatal periods of stress or a prenatal period, uh, specifically like stress or something like that, malnutrition, much more uh, firmer ground. And those uh, prenatal stressors kind of activating particular genes would put you at greater risk of, of negative health outcomes. Which brings us to the fetal origins hypothesis. This is from Barker, uh, which is the fetal origins uh, hypothesis is also uh, referred to as a fetal programming hypothesis, depending on who you're talking to. It pro he, uh, uh, he proposed that the environment in utero can alter the development of the fetus with a permanent uh, effect on health, biological and psychological outcomes. Under nutrition in utero and during infancy permanently changes the body structure, physiological met, uh, metabolism, increasing risk of cor coronary heart disease and stroke in adult life, for example. One potential mechanism is stress via the HPA access. So this is a very kind of very uh, influential uh, theory or hypothesis in my uh, research. Uh, again, kind of the idea here is that Parker uh, argues that these uterine effects uh, environments, these prenatal environments are highly predictive. In his case, he believes are like the principal uh, uh, determining factor of uh, later behavior and later uh, health outcomes. Because during prenatally, you're literally developing like your neural infrastructure, your physical infrastructure, um, and, and thus kind of um, being exposed to stressors, which may, may impede, uh, kind of in, impede or kind of in some way negatively impact uh, those uh, structure of your underlying brain development or your like organ development. It's going to um, impact you negatively in the future. And again, one mechanism proposed of this is the HPA access, which is the, uh, um, the hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal gland access. Again, you don't know, didn't know this right now, but kind of the idea, this is just one mechanism that you may have heard of cortisol, cortisol impacting or negative, too much cortisol negatively impacting organ development or kind of your brain infrastructure or slowing down uh, neuro uh, uh, myelination and thus maybe decreasing uh, your ability or at least your initial ability to perform complex tests or maybe related to uh, uh, negative uh, health outcomes. So let's walk through the theoretical interpretation of the fetal programming hypothesis a little more. A healthy prenatal environment enables the mother to impart a rich, quote, maternal forecast of uh, her develop for her developing fetus, predicting a healthy post-birth environment where resources will be plentiful and negative exposures are expected to be minimal. Relatively adverse prenatal environments may result in a poor maternal forecast for her developing fetus, a so-called, quote, thrifty phenotype that becomes a small, low-weight baby, preparing the child to survive in a poor post-birth uh, environment. Maternal forecasts and inaccurately predict the post-birth environment are hypothesized to increase risk of ill health over the child's later life. For example, an increased risk for metab uh, metabolic diseases and decreased cognitive functioning in offspring that had received a poor maternal environment, but were born into the rich environment. So kind of the idea here of, if, of the uh, prenatal environment is to kind of predict on a biological level the uh, environment that the child will eventually uh, um, uh, in, inhabit. So uh, you can imagine uh, low birth weight um, being the result of a uh, high levels of stress, like prenatal stress or low nutrition, which is basically signaling to the uh, fetus on again on like a biological level, like genetically, that oh the environment you're entering is like there's going to be little food, it's going to be tough. So you, here's what we're going to do: we're going to make you like really small, and you just have to survive. So the point is basically to survive. So then you're born low birth weight, which is then uh, a risk factor for uh, early child mortality and kind of negative developmental outcomes. But ultimately, the child survived, and again, they they adapted to their environment based on this uh, again this maternal forecast on a kind of a biological level for the fetus. And you can also imagine like this mismatch situation, where in a, a, a on a biological level, this maternal forecast is like, okay, you're going to enter an environment with very little food. It's going to be a lot of hardship, whatever. And then the uh, child is born, and now all of a sudden they're eating uh, very high sugar food, very high fat foods. And the child, on a uh, metabolic level, uh, because of that uh, uh, prenatal programming, has a, a, a uh, less ability to kind of digest those foods or process those food because the child literally on a biological level is not expecting that rich of, uh, of uh, calorie density or kind of fat 
uh, uh, or levels of sodium or whatever in their environment. But, you know, in the real world that we live in, that those kind of uh, less nutrient dense, but often like high calorie, high sodium, um, a lot of sugar, those foods are more likely to be eaten by poor people because they are they are cheaper. Right. So you have like this fundamental mismatch, which in return may put the child even at greater risk of developing something like diabetes or something like that, because the child is less able to kind of uh, are less biologically prepared to kind of deal with those specific nutrients in their environment. Also, you have to keep in mind that when a child is uh, born low birth weight, you have to, have to be careful not to like make the child uh, like gain all their weight back very quickly because they're again, their body is not like uh, uh, prepared to kind of properly um, um, digest or like intake uh, that kind of um, uh, that uh, unexpected amount of food. And thus the child again will be at risk for obesity or, or uh, diabetes or something like that. So kind of like getting a kind of like, it's called catch up growth, you know, you know this, you have to be kind of very, very careful because you can kind of like overshoot it, make a, a child grow too fast and their, bo and their body is literally not prepared on a biological level to uh, deal with that. But ultimately, this gets back to the argument that early life human beings and fetuses are, quote, plastic and able to adapt to their environment. So think of hot plastic, how you can mold it. That is kind of like what our environment is doing. So we have this structure, you know, we're not going to be born like a bird or something like that, or a giraffe. We have like that structure, but still it's moldable by our environment, like um, uh, hot plastic. The development of sweat genes provides a simple ex example of this. All humans are similar, have similar numbers of sweat glands at birth, but none of them function. In the first three years after birth, a proportion of the glands become functional depending on the temperature to which the child is exposed. The hotter the conditions, the greater the number of sweat glands that are programmed to function. After three years, the process is complete and the number of sweat glands are fixed. Thereafter, the child who has experienced hot conditions will be better equipped to adapt to similar conditions in later life because people with more functioning sweat glands cool down faster. This is the essence of developmental plasticity, a critical period when a system is plastic or more plastic and sensitive to the environment, followed by a loss of plasticity and a fixed functional capacity. For most organs in systems, the critical period occurs in utero, is the argument by Barker. So we have this sweat gland situation, wherein um, uh, even kind of like early childhood uh, environments impacting our um, our biological expressions of sweating. So where you live in a one child lives in a very hot environment, for example, or let's do this: a child lives in a very cold environment, and therefore the child is sweating less, right? So then during that so your environment shaping that biological expression. In this case, how much you're sweating, the functioning of your sweat glands. But then imagine the kid uh, at like whatever, eight years old, moves to Florida, and now it's very hot. <laughs> and now the child, uh, because the plastic period or that very sensitive or critical period, you don't need no differences for the purposes of this class, uh, is over, and now it's kind of fixed. You're locked in. You got your sweat uh, gland uh, expression. It's now locked in. Therefore, the eight-year-old child who grew up in a cold weather now is less uh, able to sweat in that environment. They're more at risk of overheating and thus like heat stroke or something along those lines. But ultimately, that is kind of the foundational argument of Barker, this developmental plasticity, which is universally agreed upon. He's just basically arguing that utero is kind of the most important uh, um, um, stage or period of uh, plasticity. Malnutrition during fetal life and infancy has been linked to development of a number of conditions, coronary heart disease, for example, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and certain cancers. All of these conditions can originate through the developmental plasticity process of fetal life. Developmental plasticity has been described as a phenomenon by which one genotype can give rise to a range of different physiological or morphological states in response to different environmental conditions during development. So the idea here is that even if a person has uh, the same genotype, identical twins, or very, whatever, very similar genes or something like that, the idea here is that those genes can ultimately be expressed in multiple ways. Those are not like X gene equals Y behavior, X gene, you know, for example, um, but rather due to kind of this plasticity situation, those genes can be expressed in multiple ways. And uh, epigenetics, again, being based on our environments. So that customization of genetic expression due to our environments. And we see this again, we have already talked about with neuroplasticity, where in our brain, our uh, myelination being uh, shaped, being influenced by our environmental conditions. For, so from like a neurological level and a bio <laughs> biological level and a genetic level, our environment's impacting uh, th how we uh, behaviorally uh, express our genes. So in our case, maybe health-related behaviors.
Next, to expand on the stress argument of, of, of a mechanism of epigenetic programming, stress, and in particular, early life adversities, these are known as ACEs, activate the stress hormone system and may epigenetically program the system toward a lifelong alteration of the hormonal response to even minor stressors. Stress exposure of parents may occur before conception, at the time of conception, at the time of pregnancy, or in the early postnatal period, where the environment of mothers influence the epigenetic patterning of their offspring which can have a long life influence, uh, lifelong influence on their behavior, emotions, and well-being, both their child's mental and physical outcomes. Children of mothers who are exposed to poverty, hunger, uh, poor diets, smoking, stress, war, or violence prenatally are prone to epigenetic influences on their offspring's later well-being. We'll talk about ACEs in a few, uh, few minutes, but kind of the idea here is that this accumulation of early life adversity, these stressors, uh, which maybe occur uh, pre uh, prenatally, um, even a little bit before conception or uh, postnatally, especially kind of in the early childhood uh, period, uh, impacting, again, epigenetic expression. Uh, so, for example, you can think of a mother, a child who's kind of newborn, the first three years of her life, their mother's like homeless. There's just a lot of adversity, just a lot of stressors uh, within the environment. Well, those stressors can impact their child through, for example, stress expression. So you can imagine a uh, child who's exposed to a lot of stressors, a lot of um, from that they experience, uh, but also through their parents or their, maybe their single mother, something like, along those lines, who is also maybe very stress reactive due to just a, a hardship life of being homeless and all the things that led up to being homeless. So that child in return, uh, those kind of that stress from their uh, mothers, who's, you know, obviously stressed out from being homeless and the stress that they're experiencing, the child that is, uh, impacting the programming of their of their uh, stress response system. So at a hormone level. So maybe those children who are exposed to a lot of stressors very early on are more likely to have overreactive stress responses in the future, which in return, overreactive stress responses are kind of associated with negative uh, behaviors, but also uh, negative health outcomes as well. As we discussed, maybe increased inflammation and there's other mechanisms as well, but which again are kind of uh, predictors of, of uh, chronic health conditions. Now let's walk through some specific studies. Barker's team uh, had earlier identified groups of men and women in middle and late life whose birth uh, weight or birth size has been recorded. In 10,000, uh, about 600 men born between 1911 and 1930, their hazard ratios for coronary heart disease fell for increasing uh, birth weight. There was stronger trends with weight at one year. The association between low birth weight and, co and coronary heart disease has since been replicated in Europe, North America, and India. So basically what this uh, Barker found was that uh, 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 children who were born low birth weight or kind of small for their size, uh, maybe height as well, um, uh, is predictive of later uh, coronary heart disease. That's what that hazard ratio is. Basically, just the likelihood, the risk. Uh, uh, it's a measurement of risk of, of developing coronary heart disease. So again, we kind of this idea, this fetal origins hypothesis, because birth weight is, uh, you know, you're just determined prenatally. So again, kind of evidence of this fetal origins hypothesis. Now, interesting though, however, the correlation between weight and coronary heart disease was higher at one year. So again, demonstrating that postnatal uh, uh, postnatal environments still mattering and kind of the epigenetic processes uh, that predict later chronic health conditions still occurring in early childhood. As well, I'll outline a few studies here, beginning with Hurricane Katrina, uh, Katrina in August uh, 2005, which was a massive hurricane that impacted uh, New Orleans. Uh, and what these researchers found and measured was severe uh, hurricane ex experience, that is your house being flooded or damaged to the house, and lower birth weight compared to other New Orleans residents, and worry about future hurricane in the region was associated with smaller birth length. So what these researchers did was measure the uh, direct experience of, of mothers who were impacted by the hurricane. So their, their house was damaged, uh, their house was flooded, something along those lines, and uh, some more kind of subjective uh, measurements of stress. So, uh, so worrying about a future hurricane. And what these researchers found was that mothers who worried uh, about uh, future hurricanes and or uh, experience severe hurricane uh, damage, such as a house being flooded, were more likely than mothers who were not exposed to severe hurricane uh, experience or not worried about their future hurricane. Those mothers, more stressed, were more likely to give uh, birth to children with smaller birth lengths, aka uh, reduced heights. So again, kind of evidence of a fetal origins hypothesis, because we also have uh, uh, research suggests that being uh, born uh, uh, with smaller birth height uh, is predictive of, of chronic illnesses uh, as an adult.
We also have the ice storms in uh, Quebec, Canada in January 1998. This is kind of like a very classic study. Uh, power outages, which range from a few hours to as long as six weeks for three million people living in Quebec. Security forces went door to door to rescue isolated individuals in danger from cold and hypothermia, asphyxiation from unconventional heating devices and fire due to block chimneys. And mothers uh, who experienced the uh, uh, the ice storm were more likely to give birth to low birth weight children as compared to mothers who gave birth a year later. So you basically can compare uh, birth outcomes a year in advance, a year later, something like that. And again, evidence of fetal origins, uh, fetal programming. And then finally, Haitian immigrants fleeing political instability from 1981 to 2006 in Canada. Uh, these, those mothers who uh, fled during uh, that um, about 25-year uh, period were more likely, uh, that is 2.8 times more likely, to give birth to low birth weight children compared to other Canadian mothers, so non-Haitian Canadian mothers. So again, evidence of, in this case here, uh, a political stressor in increasing the risk of giving birth to a low birth weight child, which again, low birth weight associated with uh, numerous negative health outcomes, especially in the global south or third world or um, non-Western countries, however you want to phrase it. Early life development, early environmental experiences can have lasting impacts on a child's later success in school and life more generally. Adverse uh, living circumstances uh, negatively impact a child's development in the first 24 to 36 months of life. And the greater the degree of adversity, the greater the odds of developmental delay, uh, delay in class. So kind of just broadly stated, early life development matters. And basically the degree to which the, the, uh, that you experience adversity matters. So the more adversity you, you experience, the greater risk you are. Uh, and this is kind of known as the, um, the dose response effect. So you can think of it like medicine, the more medicine you take, the better you'll be slash maybe eventually you'll die, but whatever, if <laughs> you take too much. But basically the idea here is the more exposure, the greater the risks there are. And basically depending on the study, there's basically a limit on um, how many stressors you have to experience before you're at risk. So it's not like, oh, I experienced one stressor, I'm doomed, but there's like a limit. And once you hit that limit, then you're at a much greater risk. And then as you go up that ladder of more stressors, then you're at greater and greater risk. Expanding on this idea of early uh, adverse early left stressors, Poverty, caregiver, uh, caregiver mental illness uh, that's untreated, uh, child malnutriment, uh, um, single parenthood, and low maternal education, which can collectively have a cumulative effect on a developing child. Mal maltreated uh, children who are exposed up to six additional uh, risks face a 90 to 100 percent likelihood of having one or more delays in their cognitive, language, and emotional development. Adults who recall experiencing seven or eight serious adverse experiences in childhood are three times more likely to have cardiovascular disease as an adult. So this is what we already talked about here, this idea of stress as cumulative impact. And once you're hitting a certain level of stressors, that's when the real risks uh, kind of really kick in. And so, for example, children who are maltreated plus uh, face six additional like uh, salient stressors are very likely to have delays in the uh, cognitive language or emotional development and uh, adults who experience a seven or eight very significant stressors some of which will outline momentarily are three times more likely to have cardiovascular disease as an adult so those stressors negatively impacting our uh, behavioral outcomes and numerous developmental outcomes but also our chronic health outcomes or acute health outcomes as well uh, through uh, their various mechanisms proposed uh, some of which include inflammation or maybe the likelihood of us uh, following like health related advice or kind of taking care of ourselves. So maybe, you know, whatever you're, you're probably mo these people are at greater risk of uh, becoming uh, depressed, uh, which then in return uh, can uh, decrease uh, uh, important lifestyles related to health, such as exercising, eating healthy um, for kind of self-evident reasons, and maybe instead rely on kind of like comfort foods like fast food or something like that. So kind of like that combination of stressors that kind of uh, quote unquote naturally occur, but not really natural, but you know, uh, kind of uh, behaviors, negative kind of behaviors and these kind of outcomes are always going to be clustered together because these are groups in general who have been oppressed or kind of like alienated from society, um, poor people, homeless people, so stuff like that. Moving on to adverse child events, uh, 11 questions that assess eight areas of abuse and household dysfunction before 18. So kind of the idea here is this cumulative uh, of, of calculation of stress before 18 years of age. There's uh, kind of the classic ACEs, but some researchers have added ones, removed others uh, for various reasons. So we'll just cover the basics, though. Uh, measures of abuse include physical abuse, verbal abuse, and sexual abuse. Measures of household dysfunction include 
living with someone with an untreated mental health problem, living with someone who abused substances, incarceration of family member, witnessing domestic violence, parental separation or divorce. Children living in poverty, including those experiencing homelessness, are more likely to experience more adverse uh, child events, that is ACEs. Children who live below the federal poverty line are five times more likely to experience greater than uh, greater than four ACEs than those who live in financially stable households. So as we talked about before, this clustering of stressors. So you're living below the poverty line, obviously you're going to expose to uh, more negative adverse environments. Thus, in return, living in poverty uh, um, increases the likelihood that you experience higher rates of ACEs. And again, ACEs kind of uh, are correlated with numerous ne negative developmental outcomes. You can literally Google ACEs and then just pick a variable and there'll be a study on it and they'll find a correlation. Like there's a correlation between ACEs and basically everything. And you know, just kind of interpretation a little bit, for example, inter in incarceration of a family member. So that could lead uh, or, you know, contribute to only a one parent household, less family income, which makes you live in more economic precarity, which allows you less nutritional uh, foods, maybe less resource, educational resources at the home. Uh, you're probably more likely to go to schools with more resources. You're more likely to be around peers who are going to also have high levels of ACEs. You can see how it's kind of one of these factors are going to be linked to all all kinds of other environmental and social relationships and social environments that it in return will collectively um, uh, predict uh, uh, negative developmental outcome. And prenatally, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, one study that I want to point out is that ACEs were also associated with higher levels of alcohol use during pregnancy. So yes, alcohol use, a, uh, a predictor of negative health outcomes in a child, uh, such as fetal alcohol syndrome, but you can see ACEs predicting it. So kind of thinking it through here again, there, these people are probably uh, at more likely to be low income, be poor, be uh, dispossessed from society, have lower uh, social support, lower economic support. Thus, again, it's like, oh man, I'm so stressed out. What can I do? I really don't want to drink this, but uh, I'm going to like lose my mind. I'm going to drink to try and self-medicate, which in return uh, uh, can negatively impact their fetus. Maybe the mother then feels guilty, they parent poorly, and et cetera. So you get this kind of cascading effect. Also, you don't need to know this. Uh, this is uh, also uh, known as the uh, uh, developmental trajectory of a person. Basically, you're on a pathway, and you're more likely to behave a certain way once you're kind of on that pathway. Parental support. Parental par par programming. Uh, increase uh, programs, as you say, increase scores on measures of psychosocial, motor, and child cognitive development. Uh, parenting programs that combine nutrition and, stim and, and stimulation has been effective in improving child cognitive and language development outcomes. So for like at-risk parents, for example, it's kind of what they're getting at here is providing parental supports. So um, uh, some kind of education related classes related to how to parent or common questions. But it's also keep in mind that uh, it's not just like, okay, sometimes it's not that a parent like doesn't recognize that like, oh, what I'm doing is <laughs> negative or whatever. It's just kind of like, well, this is the best I can do. I'm just trying to survive. These are my given, I'm constrained by my environment. So thus kind of the idea here is parenting programs with something like nutrition, like uh, food stamps or what they're called now, WIC. Uh, when I had, when my parents had it with food stamps. But the idea here is that uh, a combination of, of uh, resources, not just social resources, but uh, uh, food resources in that case to kind of improve uh, developmental outcomes. Because it's not simply enough to say, all right, change your ways. And then you go back to a shitty neighborhood and like, okay, I need you to just be super resilient and just battle through it. Not kind of a realistic outcome. We got to keep realistic outcomes in mind when we're trying to help uh, parents and children who are at risk. Moving on to breastfeeding. Breastfeeding reduces risk of early life mortality and morbidity from infectious diseases and promotes the establishment of a healthy gut microbiome. According to a systematic review in 2015, breastfeeding decreased the odds of type 2 diabetes and based on high quality studies decreased by 13% the odds of overweight slash obesity. A population based uh, birth cohort study of neonates was launched in 1982 in Pelotas. Uh, the, the researchers found that the durations of total breastfeeding and, uh, and predominant breastfeeding, that is breastfeeding as the main form of nutrition with some other foods, was positively associated with IQ test scores, educational uh, attainment, and income. So kind of the idea here is we talked about before, breastfeeding uh, uh, um, allows for children to um, – acquire some kind of the, uh, some of their mother's uh, acquired immunity from vaccines, for example, but also kind of like physical touch. Um, but also uh, you can think this through mothers who are more likely to breastfeed are more likely to have kind of like stable uh, environments. So the kind of breastfeeding is going to be kind of correlated, correlated with environments that are kind of more stable as well, because again, parents going to be kind of less stressed out. They're going to have more uh, time uh, to breastfeed. They'll probably be more confident with themselves. 
uh, they'll be better educated and stuff like that. So again, yes, breastfeeding uh, connected to these uh, positive health outcomes. But then the question is like, how do we create conditions? How do we design programs, public policies that increase the likelihood of parents understanding and having kind of uh, the energy to act on what they already know that breastfeeding is an important uh, predictor of, of uh, positive health outcomes in their uh, children. Micronutrients and child feeding. Malnutrition remains a serious challenge, especially in underdeveloped countries. New estimates based on proxy measures of stunting and poverty indicate that 250 million children, uh, that is about 43%, younger than five years in low income and middle income countries are at risk of not reaching their developmental potential. Urgent needs to increase multi-sectoral uh, 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 coverage of quality programming that incorporates health, nutrition, uh, security, safety, responsive caregiving, and early learning. Equitable early childhood policies and programs are crucial for meeting the sustainable developmental goals and for children to develop the intellectual skills, uh, creativity, and well-being required to become healthy and productive adults. Stunting and severe a, a, acute malnutrition, known as uh, 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 wasting, are often associated with com uh, concomitant micronutrient deficiencies, um, multiple no uh, micronutrient uh, supplementation in children at risk of deficiencies improves academic performance among children eight or five to 16 years of age. So stunting is especially kind of a major risk factor, especially in uh, middle and low income countries, aka countries that are typically been formerly uh, colonized and kind of the global south. Uh, and kind of uh, why that's important is because stunting, again, is, is related to a whole host of acute and negative and uh, chronic uh, uh, negative health outcomes, uh, such as early childhood death or various uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, shorter lifespan, just kind of in, uh, overall. Uh, again, and this is going to be uh, wrapped up in uh, numerous environmental uh, stressor, uh, stressors. Thus, kind of the argument being that we need kind of a comprehensive approach here that includes greater health care, nutrition, safety, all these things. There's not just kind of this one little thing like, oh, if I just create a YouTube video to tell uh, people who live in on $1 a day to take care of their child more, like that'll fix it. No, we need kind of like a, again, kind of uh, this is why it's going to automatically kind of include like public policy and these kind of things. Now, there are ways kind of to measure this. So the United Nations has, for example, sustainable developmental goals, wherein they're trying to hit certain benchmarks. So a certain percentage of illiteracy, a certain percentage of, of, of uh, early education for um, uh, uh, women or young girls, a reduction of poverty, etc. So basically, they have sets of developmental, uh, sustainable developmental goals and kind of uh, mechanisms uh, through parents, but also a bigger structural and public policy positions that should be enacted, or at least maybe not specifics, but kind of general outlines that should be enacted to kind of decrease these stuntings. So again, if you're kind of interested in it, it's kind of like public policy, health related, global health kind of situation, um, check out that link. Prevention of child maltreatment. Children who receive inadequate care, especially in the first 24 months of life, are more sensitive to the effects of stress and display more behavioral problems than do children who receive nurturing care. The uh, malnutriment prevention interventions, with the best evidence that shows positive results following the intervention, are selective programs, such as the nurse family partnership, characterized by intensive uh, uh, visits by professional home visitors, and beginning prenatally. So as we talked about before, uh, kind of early stress being associated with stress reactivity is not always stress reactivity can be under stress reactivity. So something like numbness, you can imagine just being numb to the world because you've experienced so many stressors, but ultimately kind of inadequate care and malnutrition associated with negative developmental outcomes and kind of the suggested programs are ones that are very intensive. So personal uh, uh, home visits that begin prenatally and continue on uh, throughout early childhood. Again, though, you can see these require resources and public policies. Uh, and do not kind of just rely on kind of like an infographic, which may be helpful, but um, are uh, typically insufficient. Formal and non-formal or community-based preschools improve scores on uh, direct measures of children's cognitive and psychosocial development. Regardless of the type, program quality is a key predictor of, of effectiveness. Factors of preschool quality include greater number, variety and challenging uh, play materials, interactive and dialo uh, dialogic uh, reading, classroom organization, and instructional support. So kind of the idea is that these early out-of-home interve uh, interventions as well, such as Florida Head Start, you may have heard of that. I was a 
proud Head Start graduate. Way to go, everyone. Uh, but kind of the idea here is that targeting these children who are at risk and putting them in, in, in environments wherein they have greater access to emotional support or kind of like uh, whatever, books, computers, whatever it is, uh, but that are structured and allow for the child in environments uh, outside of their home to develop uh, interpersonal skills and develop and practice uh, those kind of uh, uh, behaviors that are associated with cognitive and language development, and also, and by consequence, uh, later uh, behaviors that will be important to maintain uh, healthy uh, lifestyles. Nurturing environments in the form of care and positive interactions and individuals, individualized attention appear to be important in early learning programs. A positive emotional climate at child care centers in Chile and Ecuador included individualized attention, positive affect, and positive moods, has shown uh, positive associations with children's early childhood cognitive and social emotional skills. So kind of the idea here of these programs in Chile and Ecuador was to identify at-risk uh, children and put them in kind of a more nurturing, caring uh, environment, like a pre-K or wherever, like a school or something like that, and, uh, and creating kind of a positive emotional climate for the child, uh, which was uh, later uh, correlated with uh, child's uh, cognitive development and socio-emotional skills. Why might social emotional skills well matter? Well, for a whole host of reasons. You can imagine uh, a child who has uh, low social emotional school uh, skills goes goes to school, doesn't have a lot of friends, ends up being uh, doing very poor in school, then drops out of high school, has a low income job. Now they're kind of locked in like, a low income job. They have kind of less friends or more friends that are also kind of low social skills, uh, poor relationships, and then all of a sudden you have all those kind of stressors, and you're in and combined with. Uh, uh, advert, you're now in more adverse environments, contributing to kind of less access to healthcare, especially in the US where your healthcare is connected to your job and kind of lower rates of healthy uh, lifestyle behaviors due to a whole host of stre uh, stressors and kind of a decreased kind of ability to kind of navigate the, your challenging adverse circumstances, which by, by itself is quite challenging. But we will leave it there. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. And I hope you have a great week. Bye.